everyone to the fourth day of feminist conference here in Brno we are meeting online yet again today with me Katarina Slezakova is a host and the lecturer of today Minya Baginova welcome today hi how are you hi hi nice to see you I am I'm fine it's a bit rainy here I guess in Brno too but <laughs> oh yeah it's, it's raining the whole day in Brno which is a good news good news for us I think because then maybe more people enjoy it because there is uh, not such nice weather outside today so I would like to welcome you Mina and introduce you briefly before your uh, presentation about feminist movements in Latin America so you are an activist anthropologist, you focused on social movements and feminist um, feminist mobilization. Um, now you are settled in Central Eastern Europe, uh, if correctly, yes, uh, but previously you did research and ethnography in Turkey, Greece, Latin America, is that right? Yes, that's correct, yeah. <laughs> Great. Is there anything more that you would like to say before starting your lecture? Uh, no, not really, just uh, maybe um... Yeah, I, I just want to say actually a huge thank you to Zdrushani for organizing this fantastic event and uh, it's it's a huge shame that we can't meet in person, uh, but still it's uh, it's been amazing, so thank you so much. Really well, thank you for joining us even in this online space, which is a bit tiring after this whole year being online. Um, I just want to let our viewers know that Yet again, you can send us questions uh, in comments of this video. Um, so, and we will answer the comments or the questions and uh, respond to them after Mina's lecture. So the stage is yours and I'm very much looking forward to your lecture. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I haven't, you know, prepared uh, sort of like a, a PowerPoint per se, just a bit of, um, let's say, a background uh, to 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 what I'm what I'm going to what I'm going to talk about and uh, maybe at the beginning I just would like to uh, put myself in the context of the <laughs> research in, in Latin America uh, so I have been engaged in uh, with activism uh, in Latin America on, on sort of on two levels um, first while uh, living and working in uh, in the region as an anthropologist feminist movements in Argentina and, and Poland. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, American scholars, uh, really with the aim to show the, the uh, pluriversality of um, feminisms in the region as they are uh, co-creating um, the discussion uh, among each other. Um, so, as we know, Latin America, of course, is an extensive region uh, which comp uh, comprises a vast number of countries, um, each with uh, its own distinct cultures and flavors and, uh, and stories. Um, however, Latin American countries all share a political past uh, that includes, of course, colonialism, a uh, string of dictatorships, uh, strong links with socialism, and a very complex power dynamic with um, both the United States uh, as well as the major um, European powers. And all of this shapes contemporary politics in Latin America, including uh, the development of feminist social movements and their struggles um, <clears throat> for political voice. Um, so the evolution of feminist mobilization in Latin America, but also the Caribbean, even though I'm not going to talk about the Caribbean today, um, is really largely connected to national, regional and global changes, or as, as, at least historically. Uh, so when the region uh, was consumed with uh, militaristic regimes and civil wars, um, feminist and non-feminist women activists had uh, all kinds of issues uh, to deal with and to confront, such as um, revolutionary struggles for national liberation and the ongoing um, search for disappeared and loved ones. Um, 
but as these struggles subsided, uh, and we can argue some more successfully than others, uh, women really have found themselves in a, in a variety of positions. So a very common trend has uh, been the virtual dismissal uh, of uh, women's political contributions to the various uh, leftist social movements that consumed the region in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and this often really blatant ignoring of women's uh, participation in many cases um, served to push women out of um, formal politics and to start their own autonomous feminist organizations. Um, but also we, in other cases, women did seize the opportunity provided by the uh, emergencies of civil society in the new democratic uh, structures uh, to insert themselves sort of into this formal political structures um, that in many cases did not um, exist before. Uh, although the success of this uh, insertion into uh, uh, official politics is uh, kind of a question to debate or, or the success of, of this uh, insertion is, is uh, open to debate. Um, what we see in Latin America today definitely um, is the autonomous feminist organizations, grassroots activism that uh, is really shaping the, the Latin American um, political landscape. Um, so like I said, Latin American feminism is really plural and diverse, and this plurality also entails tension between them, and but also many points in common. Um, so what we see on the landscape is um, urban upper and middle class feminisms, which have fought traditionally sort of for the expansion of citizenship, because these classes are uh, actually included in democracy. Uh, and, and these uh, feminisms have given uh, important struggles against violence and femicide, um, such as the, the famous Ni Una Menos in Argentina. Um, however, there are also divergences between these feminisms and, for instance, indigenous feminism, uh, fem indigenous feminisms uh, in Latin America. So for urban feminists or for middle class and, and uh, high, uh, high class feminisms, indigenous feminisms really um, is considered as sexist, uh, mostly due to the ethnocentrism of indigenous feminism. Um, and sometimes we, we see this uh, really difficult tension to understand indigenous community vision, uh, which um, in a sort of um, in a public eye, you, you still see uh, a, a man uh, kind of uh, having the, the, the final say. Um, so you, we see all these uh, tensions and discussions, um, but something that is similar uh, on a point of uh, convergence uh, in Latin America uh, or the feminism in Latin America is, uh, is the body. Um, body as a starting point for reflection and action. And uh, feminisms in this sense are reflection and action as situated sort of from this territory of the body. And uh, in, the, in the case of Latin America, therefore, decolonial feminisms refer to a really a thinking from the South. And, and I produce also from the struggles of women uh, whose bodies have been racialized and exported in, um, in, in different ways. Um, so this is something to really bear in mind if you, uh, before we even discuss uh, any, any particular uh, uh, movement. Um, and so like thinking about uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about today, I, I, want, I want to sort of uh, lead this discussion um, into thinking a little bit more deeply about uh, Latin American feminism. So like a little bit uh, deeper than what we usually see um, uh, in, in the media. Um, and so I have, uh, for this purpose, identified uh, several points that I, I believe <laughs> that we need to really bear in mind um, for, for a sort of a fuller comprehension of uh, feminisms, different feminisms um, in the region. <clears throat> so one of the really a bases of Latin American feminism but also social movements kind of more generally is uh, challenging uh, the Eurocentric 
uh, ontology and Eurocentric knowledge, if you like. Uh, and, and this is really at the heart of uh, Latin American social movements. Um, and Anglo-centric and Eurocentric ways of representing knowledge, such as discursive and different ideological impediments, really make it quite difficult to conceive and develop ways of um, feminist uh, feminist uh, theorizing that arise from, from this uh, interconnectedness of the feminist scholars by the Latin American conditions affecting their um, social and, uh, and cultural life. Uh, Latin American feminist scholars uh, approach to kind of a grounding um, knowledge uh, and it's, it is a knowledge based on really um, principles of pursuing a critical approach to knowledge, uh, a concern for the relationship, um, well, but maybe that's, that's more of a sort of, <laughs> of a scholarly audience, the relationship between theory and practice, um, an orientation sort of towards progressive political projects of freedom and liberation, but always in the context of Latin American history and politics. Um, and this uh, actually goes back sort of back to sort of 1960s and 70s uh, when uh, we first see this Latin American critique of Eurocentrism uh, in the social sciences. Um, especially when some of the most important social scientists in Latin America become critical of uh, capitalist development, economies, um, and uh, after they articulated the concept of uh, dependency theory, uh, which analyzed uh, and protested the imposition of a Western capitalist model of modernization on uh, Latin American states. Um, so various forms of uh, critical theory uh, subsequently emerged, uh, including the critique of uh, you know, so-called internal colonialism of Latin American states uh, toward their own indigenous populations, and the critical analysis of social movements for democracy, um, for instance, in Argentina, Chile, Brazil, uh, and other popular causes, among others. Um, and so what we see is that history, culture, and power as sites for an interconnected relations with knowledge uh, as central features of the critical conceptions of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, and therefore feminist uh, theory in Latin America, especially in the, in the, in the mainstream social science is really grafted onto on this critical conception uh, of, of knowledge. So uh, feminist critical tools, such as the critique of women's subordination uh, or patriarchal power, um, really deepened and expanded the critical approaches to knowledge that flourished, especially during the, the second half of the 20th century, like I said, and this really continues to sustain and expand the feminist uh, theorizing um, today. Um, also, really to be borne in mind uh, is the premise that um, modernity or postmodernity really uh, have, they do not have the same meaning in Latin America as they do, for instance, in Europe uh, or in the US. Uh, in Latin America, modernity is associated politically with uh, nation building after the dem demise of the colonial era. Uh, so culturally, it has been associated with a scientific or science compatible outlook toward the, <clears throat> towards the world and with a kind of um, uh, aided <laughs> developments in Europe or elsewhere in the industrialized uh, world. And postmodern uh, in Latin American context could uh, therefore mean the transformation of this modern world vision uh, through a variety of factors um, were breaking the linear or um, predominantly Eurocentric narrative of modernity is really the, 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 the paramount almost. <laughs> um, and as said, um, feminist scholars across Latin America have argued that they can also construct their own postmodern critiques of authoritarian uh, patriarchal politics and, and society. And uh, these scholars also emphasize that although modern, postmodern, whatever critiques of authoritarian um, patriarchal politics, um, that uh, even though uh, they kind of appear in the margins 
uh, of, uh, of a social science today, it is still up to Latin Americans or Latin American feminists to insert their voices into these new, uh, new openings of understanding of what feminism means uh, for them, uh, from their own uh, understanding and from their own uh, uh, knowledge theorizing, if you like. <laughs> Um, so all this really, uh, I just said, everything that I just said really needs to be considered when understanding also feminist social movements um, in Latin America today. Uh, and of course, this understanding really needs uh, a little bit sort of extra work <laughs> if we are trying to conceptualize uh, the, the new frameworks of Latin American activists. Um, so for, for instance, for me as an anthropologist um, from Europe and educated in Europe, uh, this also requires an extra theoretical work to understand very different aspects of identity politics that underlie feminist movements in Latin America as if it were in, in Europe. Um, so for instance, when I was working with, uh, with the migrant women in the, in the popular kitchens uh, in Colombia, uh, the language that many of those women from the popular sector who were at the time protesting the neoliberal um, governmental measures, uh, the language that they used um, was based on their everyday experiences uh, in the home. So this language had you know, nothing, nothing to do with Marxism or even the critique of uh, neoliberalism or capitalism. Uh, in this, uh, you know, in, in this nice sort of <laughs> Spanish, let's say. Um, and quite often, you know, if they were ridiculed by some, because they really, these women really did not use the established discourses of labor unions uh, or, you know, leftist politicians. Um, what I realized, uh, and that's actually kind of the anthropological scholarship anyway, is that the other side of this coin was that they confronted the limits of public discourse by using terms uh, associated with women's homegrown experience. Um, and such discursive practices really contributed to transforming the private and public split uh, that confined, of course, women to the home and left the political, even left political leadership positions primarily really open um, to men. Um, and another interesting case in point, uh, I once discussed with my colleague uh, who was working in Ecuador uh, about a debate over the term uh, queer among activists. Um, so having traveled to Ecuador to interview activists in the, in the LGBTQI movement uh, regarding their views on the leftist politics of change taking place there at the time, it was a few years ago, uh, my colleague found that uh, actually the most radical wing of this movement identified as uh, transfeminista. And in Latin America, queer is simply often associated with the Northern or let's say Western cultural imperialism. And it is seen as a notion that reinforces a whitening, um, a whitening and, uh, or, or homogenization of people who do not fit within the cultural prescribed, uh, culturally prescribed uh, gender roles um, of their societies. And so when queer studies, as we know them in Europe, for instance, uh, are discussed in academic seminars in Ecuador, um, it is really not unusual for Ecuadorians to uh, kind of <laughs> resignify the notion and give them really new names linked to local experiences. Uh, and so transfeminista has been a successful identification um, arising from such a local resignification of queer studies. Um, and so for the transfeminist current, trans uh, implies a break not only with the traditional gender system, but um, also with other forms of normativities, uh, such as based on race, ethnicity or class or geopolitical um, location. And so these trans feminist activists argued that they could organize around a trans feminist agenda in a local context where trans already carried uh, a cultural meaning of activism combined with, uh, with this transgression. Um, and, and they took queer really to stand for more of an academic term, really disconnected from everyday um, activism. Um, and so 
these and very similar interpretations uh, of this and disputes over identity terminology used in feminist studies, uh, which in my opinion show how really important it is to relate um, uh, a theory that even if we are as uh, activists uh, theorizing something from, from Europe, uh, to understand the practice on the ground in other, uh, other cultural um, uh, settings um, is really about allowing for open lines of communication and also interaction between, uh, between activists uh, from, from uh, really different, different backgrounds. Um, so another point is that they're really at the heart of feminisms in Latin America, there has always been this emancipatory political project, um, whether articulated as uh, so-called women, women's cause uh, or women's rights, reproductive rights, gender equality, stopping violence against women, um, or a host of popular uh, emancipatory movements. Um, of course, this is the region of the world where freedom has been as much curtailed and destroyed as it has been fought for and enacted. Uh, political economies shift, uh, autocratic governments come and go, and there is still no end to <laughs> the need for emancipatory politics. Uh, oppression has left its historical mark on these societies for sure since the day of colonialism, if not even earlier. But freedom for, uh, from imperialism, from neocolonialism, from internal colonialisms, patriarchal um, and authoritarian mentalities, racism, systematic poverty, and gender oppression, among others, uh, really continue uh, and constitute important priorities um, for, for those who simply want to live together with others in the societies and free from systematic violence. And, um, and cruelty. Um, and so this moving beyond freedom from to freedom for, um, just what exactly then constitutes democratization uh, in, in terms of uh, understanding of the of feminist uh, social movements? Well, uh, of course, it's a, it's a really uh, a source of intense debate, and, and I think that's something that often is not really, of course, uh, uh, said in the media. Um, but uh, feminism in Latin America simply constitutes of many, many political stances uh, taken from the versions of Marxism to those of uh, neoliberal capitalism, as well as feminist interventions in political movements and um, organizing. And so, at the level of intersubjectivity, really, this dialogue and reciprocity and attunement to the needs of others, especially those who are most vulnerable, uh, provides a, a ground for thinking of freedom for, as the freedom to live peacefully and creatively without fear, violence, hostility, abuse. And this concept of freedom and liberation in a feminist, uh, Latin American feminist um, understanding really needs to be grounded in, in, their, in their own historical and cultural context if they are to be understood uh, or appropriately. Um, so if we think of a giant picture of Latin America as moving gradually from the 1980s uh, through the 1990s into global uh, neoliberal political economy, really one of the interesting features to notice is that at the same time, many countries of the region were also trans transitioning out of local political military dictatorships. These were entering the new forms of economic and political dependence on uh, terms of dictated by instruments of the neoliberal capitalist global economy, such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund. Um, and so feminist activists were able uh, to benefit from the gradual erosion of the military dictatorships, but at the same time, many were absorbed, um, if you like, into the, the new neoliberal system that became dominant. And that is, as we know well by now, really steadily and systematically widened the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, and so the idea of integrating women or feminists into local, regional, national politics was part of the democratizing projects. The problem, however, was that the economic system these countries uh, were forced to adopt was also hurting women in massive numbers. And uh, a number of democracies were especially weak 
as they transitioned out of the dictatorships. Um, and so in this case of uh, countries um, uh, that had been free of military dictatorships, uh, given their dependence on Western capitalism and generally weak national uh, economies, they also had to pass through the global politics of um, structural adjustment and neoliberal reform. Uh, all of which exacerbated, of course, class divisions among women, also uh, including those in the in the feminist movements. Um, and so maybe the the question uh, that actually the activists today uh, from feminist movements are asking is: So what is then the, the, this transformative feminist politics um, for Latin American? Uh, world and um, given the advances of post, uh, the post-colonial and the feminist thought, um, such a transformation really would need to be a decolonizing one as well. So here again, we enter a very highly complex issue that elicits its own set of debates um, about methods uh, and knowledge again. So one way of, uh, or another, uh, decolonization involves overcoming the privileges and institutional power structures that a Eurocentric coloniality and or Anglo and Eurocentric modernity uh, coupled with really gendered ethno-racial and class hierarchies uh, held over the shaping of identities and communities, as well as over the distribution of resources in, in Latin American uh, societies. Uh, and so here, really, the uh, colonization involves a constant challenge to move beyond domination at both the personal and collective levels. Um, however, in the feminist movement and in feminist theory in Latin America, um, decolonization signals also empowering approach to unleash the testimonies and perspectives of women, uh, women of color, uh, queer communities, trans, ecological feminists, um, and really anyone whose political value uh, or social cultural standing has been uh, aligned or suppressed by patriarchy, uh, dominant consortiums of power. Um, this orientation relies on a uh, documentation taken from oral narratives and requires really collaborative research projects. So for instance, uh, such as the work of Silvia Federici in Latin America, who really works with the poorest and the most marginalized uh, women. Um, and at the same time, I, I had a great, uh, for me, one of the most uh, fascinating um, activists I've met well, it was, for instance, uh, anthropologist, uh, Bolivian anthropologist and activist, uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, for example, who has for decades uh, worked on with um, indigenous and mestiza women uh, from the Andean region uh, of uh, South America. So, the fundamental point is really not to fail to uh, acknowledge the creative potential of those women, right? And groups that have existed uh, in our societies behind a, a veil of silence, whether because of poverty, ethnicity, or race. Um, in other words, and it's very crucial really to, um, before we start to analyze any <laughs> feminist collective or movement is that Latin American women's activism really emerges from these daily life situations uh, characterized by exploitation and suffering and struggle and uh, definitely marginality. Um, and consequently, in most Latin American countries, feminists initially gave higher priority to working uh, with poor and working class women active in the larger movement, uh, helping women then to organize community survival struggle as well, uh, at the same time fostering this uh, consciousness on how gender, uh, how gender roles uh, shaped uh, their own political, political activism. And so here we are uh, entering the with all this in mind, I think now we can <laughs> enter a little bit of uh, I guess something that um, uh, most of us already uh, know anyway, um, and, and this is the, of course the, the green wave protest across uh, Latin America, um, which started um, 
well, I, I for me as an anthropologist, I, I don't really like these starting points, but okay, let's go to, <laughs> uh, let's say year 2019, when uh, several Latin American countries, uh, of course, experienced a wave of uh, really unprecedented mobilizations. Uh, and there was a cautious optimism that the region was uh, on the verge of uh, correcting its sort of long-standing inequality problems. Um, so we, we, we saw protesters in Chile demanded uh, an end to neoliberal economic policies, eventually really securing major concessions uh, from the government, including a promised uh, referendum on amending the dictatorship era constitution. Um, in Colombia, protesters filled streets across the country uh, calling for an overhaul of the pension system and better protections for those most, uh, most vulnerable. Um, well, the talk at the time of, a sort of, uh, of the so-called Latin American um, spring may have been a stretch. Um, however, the sense that the, you know, the, the winds were kind of shifting towards uh, incrementally more socially region or more socially just region um, with governments more responsive to all citizens was, uh, I guess, very, very palpable at that time. Um, and of course, one of the most significant stories of the last decade in Latin America was the flourishing of the regional grassroots feminist movement that put gender politics really at the center of public debate. Uh, the mobil mobilization emerged first in uh, response to staggering rates of femicide and other forms of gender violence and uh, then mounted challenges to the region's abortion laws, which uh, were among the world's uh, most restrictive. Um, and so beginning in Argentina and spreading to Chile, Ecuador, Mexico and elsewhere, uh, the movement washed the region, sort of washed the region in green, if you like, green for the for the scarves that um, activists wore around their necks um, or tied to their uh, backpacks or whatever. Um, and it, this really has become kind of a symbol of solidarity um, among activists across the across the whole region. Um, so maybe I just recapitulate uh, about the new Namenos because I understand that it's, uh, of course, with the, the latest victory, it's, we should really <laughs> uh, maybe give it a little bit more attention. So as we know, the first march was held on June 3rd, 2015 in 80 cities across Argentina um, and brought together a really impressive uh, 300,000 people. Um, well, the, the whole kind of inspiration uh, grew uh, across the region because the following year in Mexico, uh, we had uh, massive uprisings, uh, feminist uprisings on, uh, on the streets to protest against police violence. Um, in Brazil, the movement inspired, uh, Argentinian women movement inspired women to organize demonstrations <clears throat> against the then president, um, Eduardo Cunha, um, who, uh, who really made it uh, even more difficult uh, for women to access the abortion. Um, and later the protests escalating, escalated following um, the murder of uh, Maria Lefranco uh, in 2018. And so really women returned to the streets um, uh, in Brazil to respond to also to Bolsonaro's candidacy for the presidency after the message, um, El Nao or not him. Um, so the organization of the protests and the scope of the protests are really the result of women's work or our feminist movement's work. Um, the de demand was not specific to the feminist agenda, but for instance, um, not him, um, a Brazilian movement really became the largest women's, mo women's mobilization, but women's LGBT, uh, queer, mo I should really emphasize, mobilization in the history um, of Brazil. And they really demonstrated that Latin American uh, activists, uh, feminist activists have the capacity to impose uh, changes also very quickly because just in a few years, the, the landscape has changed really, um, really significantly. Um, so maybe to analyze a little bit deeply, uh, a little bit more uh, Nuna Mena. So when the campaign for legal, safe and free abortion 
a key articulating role, the demand for abortion in Argentina reached the, really the mass level, undergoing a, a pre period of unprecedented expansion since, since uh, yeah, 2018. Uh, and with the mass feminist movement, the issue of abortion has been uh, taken up as a sort of common objective because it was understood as an important element of fighting for bodily and territorial autonomy. Uh, and it was really this new way of disputing and practicing um, political decision, political decision making, or uh, of identifying the spe specialities over which um, decisions are exercised and how those decisions are uh, later materialized in political in in uh, in policies. And so, over the course of these uh, few years, the the debate about abortion has really touched on everything in, in Argentina. It um, it has become a conversation of everyday household, uh, of uh, everyday conversation in the households, in, in neighborhood, in organizations, uh, unions, or even more conservative uh, movements. Um, so, uh, but in the streets, it was really led by by the youngest, uh, by the youngest on one side, with a sort of uh, kind of support from the previous generations, uh, such as Madres, the Plaza de Mayo. Um, and so this struggle for abortion really combines uh, different tactical repertoires uh, from parliamentary uh, lobbying and advocacy to more autonomous practices that have made abortion a real possibility um, in, in, in Argentina. And uh, because I'm running out of time, but maybe here I would really like to stress that um, in, in Latin America, whenever abortion is spoken about, it is also about work and labor of women. That, so this economic dimension of abortion really um, does not only refer to uh, the, the business of the of this sort of uh, of this condition of you know private clinics that profit from the practice, but also the mandate of obligatory maternity uh, that guarantees free reproductive labor to maintain the, the resources uh, from an infinite number of uncounted working days. Um, so uh, today there is a public discussion about care and work and reproductive labor more generally, actually thanks to this debate on, on abortion. Uh, and this is really due to this, uh, how how social, how feminist movement uh, has has grown, um, and also prioritize the discussion about what is recognized as work uh, or as a labor, and what is not, and what is paid, and what is not, uh, and how rights are being really instrumentalized uh, while making undisputed, while making um, visible people who have been uh, historically uh, disregarded, and so so yeah, so this green. Uh, color <laughs> has become a symbol of struggle uh, and really an image that, uh, that uh, encompasses a lot of battles um, to, together. And it has certainly transcend, transcended into uh, all region. Like I said, the recent Chilean revolt uh, was definitely, it was of course led by the feminist leadership. Uh, protesters who took to the street during the crisis in Peru uh, feminists and queer candidates um, in the municipal elections in Brazil, uh, or Colombians uh, protesting on the streets against the atrocities of the poli police violence uh, as we speak. Um, they all wear green scarves, which has really become the symbol of Latin American uh, resistance today. Um, so it has also become the symbol of the meaning of um, autonomy, if you like, for expanding the, the collectives and the bodies who participated in the protests. Um, and this debate has been expanded on who can participate in political decisions. Um, and so according to, to, to the feminists uh, in Argentina, or, but also of course elsewhere, um, this symbol of the green wave really uh, symbolize uh, a new way of living, of combining demands, as well as proposing a new uh, political alliances. And as well as it kind of expresses this sort of 
resources of self-defense when it comes uh, to put one's body on the line in the public space, um, such as protests. And uh, well, I already, uh, I also prepared a little bit. I really wanted to talk about the, the Buen Vivir and the feminist perspective on decolonial, decolonial feminism. Um, of course, I, I sorry, I'm apologize. I, I, I miscalculated the time a little bit. So uh, maybe we can just open the floor to discussions and the questions. Um, if you have any, and maybe this uh, amazing, uh, wonderful topic, uh, we'll, we can we can maybe discuss another time and with another opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm getting back to you, Mina. Just a second. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Maybe um, our viewers can let us know if they want to extend your uh, presentation a little bit and so you can tell us about Glenn Weaver as well. Um, but for the time being, I'm going to ask some questions, especially the questions that were posted uh, or commented by our we uh, viewers. So the first question would be, in some social movements of Latin America are active even Catholics Catholics, Zapatistas, for example. What are the relations between South American feminism and liberation theology? Would be the first question. Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. Uh, this uh, relationship um, is uh, uh, still very much alive, uh, particularly by the older generation of activists, such as uh, Madre de Plaza de Mayo, where um, of course, who were protesting or organizing at the time when uh, liberation of theology was very much um, alive, of course, and uh, d d during the dictatorships. Um, so the way it is maybe alive today uh, is, uh, from what I actually observed, is in a sense that um, so one of the basic strategies of Latin American social movements is this uh, memory convoking, memory of uh, former struggles and uh, of former protests, especially during the dictatorships, really plays um, an important role. And it is there that you see this uh, influence of the of the liberational um, liberational theology um, today. In this um, in, in in this memory convoking processes, um, yeah, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe I will ask a little additional question before moving on to another question from the viewer. Um, so here we see some other actors interfering or cooperating or integrating or whatever with uh, feminist mobilization and movements. What are another actors that interfere in um, the field of feminist activism in Latin America, whether those be internal or maybe external outside of Latin America? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, certainly transnational um, activism or transnationalism plays a very important uh, strategic role in, in uh, feminist organizing, uh, saying that that are, actually has been a tradition uh, of environmental social movements already see, since 1960s, 70s, um, to actually visibilize the, the, the struggle. Uh, so definitely we see, but we definitely see these connections maybe even more, um, of course, now with the social media <laughs> and, and, and so on. But yes, these transnational, at least symbolic connections are definitely there and they exist and uh, such as the case of Argentina and Poland, um, for sure. Um, other actors, uh, well, uh, of course, um, I, I think from what I really appreciated from the activists in Argentina was this uh, honesty saying that actually uh, they did lobby it also with uh, Catholic politicians and so on. So, you know, sometimes you see this sort of romanticization of a struggle, uh, especially from the from, from some of the Western leftists, I would say. Uh, but um, but know that there is this constant discussion and uh, also with actors such as uh, Catholic politicians and so on. Um, and sort of, of course, in also in case of Argentina, the the fact that abortion uh, ban was dismissed finally was, uh, of course, about uh, decades and decades of struggle, or uh, but also about this uh, strategy uh, with uh, with certain actors. Yeah. Great, thank you. Another question um, is, what are specific reasons why the grassroots feminist activism is thriving in Latin America these days? 
So maybe some sort of question about the preconditions or prerequisites for grassroots mm -hmm. to emerge. So um, I, you know, I I would say that that struggle has always been there. Uh, of course, there are uh, so the reasons why why we see such successes, such as um, the uh, uh, abortion being at least. Uh, legal legally legal you know another thing will be actually implementing uh this stuff uh in reality but uh well what are the prerequisites for today i mean we we really see this um uh, dissatisfaction with uh neoliberal governments uh in, in in the last i don't know how many 10 or 15 years for sure um we already we've seen um uh, uh this uh, you know as a, as a social movement scholar i often hear about this uh, protest waves but it's like you know it, it was last year it was uh, 10 years ago five years ago and even 15 years ago so <laughs> uh so what we can see what we can really talk about is this continuous uh continuous uh, uh, uh struggle but yeah the to answer the question of what are really the prerequisites um i uh uh, I, I think I know what kind of answer you would like to hear, but uh, for me, again, I will just go, you know, uh, into saying that this is a continuous struggle. It's, uh, of course, there are uh, uh, possibly such as, you know, the changes of the governments in Argentina, certain things became more possible than before. Um, but this is really a continuous, continuous struggle um, when, and, and sometimes, you know, uh, opportunity opens up. Uh, but uh, if we, and I think that uh, um, activists from Argentina and, and the scholars from Argentina really stress this, uh, we've been working for this for decades and decades and decades with the little successes, with little, little steps. And that's also how, how we should understand the activism uh, in itself, at least so, I mean, Latin American context and well, perhaps even for hours, it would be helpful. <laughs> So, Vina, I think you will have to talk about Buen Viver a little bit because uh, our viewers are demanding it. So, if you don't mind, could you expand a little bit on that point and also on the decolonial feminism? That would be nice. Maybe you can also share the screen if you have something prepared. Mm -hmm. then... Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I, I'm, I'm very happy. Um, because I think this is, uh, this is a part of a very important part of, uh, of feminist uh, uh, activism in Latin America that is often not being discussed enough to, in, in my mind, uh, particularly in, uh, well, uh, in, let's say in Czech Republic or in, in this region. We, of course, with the debate on abortion, we focus so much on abortion, but at the same time, I often feel that I'm, you know, that I'm not really in, engaging the, the very uh, important, like, uh, you know, uh, aspects of feminism that is just as crucial uh, to understand the Latin American context. Um, and so, so uh, when we feel is a discourse, let's say, <laughs> if you like, or that has emerged, uh, that has emerged really out of um, indigenous uh, belief system uh, rooted in ancient animistic, uh, animistic um, uh, beliefs and practices. Uh, and, and these beliefs are really constructed around uh, supra entities and uh, sort of this elaborate myths as, um, as opposed to a rational explanation based on science. Uh, and this aspect of when we really, really challenges the um, rational assumptions of uh, just, you know, either state policies through national constitutions and decolonial feminism at the same time, which really allowed, um, and all this allowed indigenous women, uh, most of all, to uh, the discursive space to sort of reflect on uh, and build their own proposals uh, from principles assumed as their own um, and not imposed uh, from, from outside. Uh, and so it is also important to say that women really found the space, indigenous women found the space to oppose um, this discrimination and violence that they of, often uh, face uh, outside and uh, but also within indigenous communities um when in, invoking the sort of the, the female male um principle of non-hierarchical uh complementary 
in nature. Uh, and actually, the, they, they call it um, uh, Chakavarmi. Uh, Chakavarmi the <laughs> uh, so uh, this is, of course, an important aspect of indigenous femi uh, feminism, uh, even though they probably wouldn't even call it feminism, but for the sake uh, of, the, <laughs> of the discussion, let's, let, let's call it this way. So the indigenous communities, uh, and particularly women, um, and, and we're talking about uh, mostly Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, approached really uh, Buen Vivir as a possibility for a necessary change in the colonial relations of their societies. and and found this space in their respective, uh, in their own constitutional, indigenous constitutional assemblies um, to contribute to, to the draft uh, indigenous constitutions. So in the case of Ecuador, uh, the text um, ended up with the same um, references and the use of really developmentalist language, um, which some participants uh, of this of this process attributed to the intervention made by um, international advisors and consultants. Um, so Bolivian constitution showed a closer uh, alignment to uh, the Buen Vivir discourse, um, but the intervention of political parties uh, then resulted sort of in, in a change to more uh, than I think 100 articles uh, pre uh, previously approved by the assembly um, by political representation, representatives in Congress. Um, so, uh, and, and since then, really, since this, since this process, uh, 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 and really uh, putting Buen Vivir as a discourse in public policy design and, and but, uh, the exclusion and racialization of uh, indigenous women, um, we, we can say still persists in Ecuador and in Bolivia. So uh, the fact that matters uh, of importance to indigenous women were translated through this developmental language. Um, and also the violence and kind of this, this possession against indigenous people uh, with women enduring, of course, the most uh, continues. However, what, what happened was that um, it has, the one really has opened up sort of a, a different, let's say, a space of knowledges, right? Uh, and so we can uh, uh, see when we today as a as a as a modern or even socialist proposal. Um, we can see it as a postmodern proposal or or as a proposal of a, of, a, of a decolonial uh, feminism. But uh, to, just to I, I think it, um, just to really narrow it down, it's. What's really important is to understand it as, a, as an instrument for the most marginalized women, such as um, uh, indigenous women um, in Ecuador or in Bolivia, um, to, to pursue their own, uh, their own uh, organization their, their, through their own needs, but also through their um, own, uh, through their own um, analysis. Um, and yeah, so I really wanted to <laughs> mention this because uh, I, I think especially, you know, with the, uh, I think I, I see a lot talking about um, feminism in Argentina, Chile, whatever, in this urban, uh, from the urban middle classes, um, but uh, the, the, this indigenous reality is, is often not really mentioned, so I wanted to <laughs> have this in there. In, in this presentation, of course, uh, talking about Latin American feminist movements more in generally, I just felt that well, this uh, I couldn't, I cannot miss this. <laughs> okay, so now I'm on. <laughs> well, hopefully, we satisfied some of our viewers with this little. Um, with this little expansion uh, on the topic of the colonial feminism. Maybe I would uh, like to ask a bit of a deeper question of on the relation of the decolonial um, indigenous feminism and of the urban middle class or upper middle class feminism. Are these organizations cooperating in any way? Is it somehow interconnected or is it like a separate field that they, they, they operate on? Mm. Uh, well, it really depends on on uh, on, a, on a space and on a different context. Um, in more in generally, there is you really see these 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 tensions um, between um, 
uh, between these two, let's say, um, um, environments. Uh, urban classes, of course, uh, blaming, uh, often seeing uh, indigenous uh, feminism or indigenous communities as more uh, conservative. Uh, but, you know, the I, I think one of the uh, the, the main reasons why, for instance, uh, uh, the feminist movement in feminist movement in Argentina has been so successful is that they really did work. Um, they really made their work uh, in order. So, so they really try to bring all these worlds together. So for decades and decades, um, the uh, uh, feminists from uh, more educated, more from urban middle classes would come uh, to the most marginalized places uh, and uh, really try to have this discussion. And, uh, you know, uh, so, so uh, because th that is the, this, this work, this, this really sort of, um, <laughs> This is the most difficult world uh, work, right? To have this discussion despite uh, very different backgrounds and, uh, and and but they they manage that uh, and that's one of the main uh impulses why uh, the movement in argentina is so has become so successful because they managed to converge everything together yeah yeah because this is often also maybe the issue that uh, even not in latin america but if we have the middle classes and then people who are more marginalized in this case being the indigenous uh, women and uh, and people then in that case also the issues and maybe the problems they are dealing with are a bit different right so then there is a lot of work necessary for that to meet somewhere and to kind of um, find the common ground maybe in this mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And um, I, like I said at the beginning, um, uh, for instance, um, feminist struggles from from previous uh, from previous decades, uh, such as during the dictatorship or, or after the transitioning from dictatorship to uh, neoliberal <laughs> democracies. Uh, Really, the it was always the urban middle class that is part of the of this democracy. The, the rest is always excluded, right? So, um, in order to for movements to really uh, become as large as in Argentina, but also uh, as it is becoming in Chile, this work has to be done. Absolutely, it's uh, it's crucial. Yeah, but as maybe in the case of Argentina, you know. It, can take decades <laughs> and some very difficult discussions so yeah maybe uh just uh one or maybe two more questions we will see uh one question that i have related to this is that you have mentioned that in case of argentina there was a real effort to connect with the indigenous women so when i was thinking about uh, throughout your presentation i was thinking oh so we are talking about the whole of latin america right which is a broad topic and of course if we look at european feminism we can from the outside we can say it has some specific or typical characteristics. But once you go a bit deeper, you start to find the differences, for example, typically East, West uh, in Europe or even North and South uh, in Europe and so on. So if you um, could maybe briefly describe what are some differences, maybe geographical or geopolitical, that define the different branches or the different feminisms across, uh, across Latin America? Mm, yeah, no, uh, of course, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I really um, had a kind of this cringe of you know talking about Latin America and, uh, as uh, yeah, of course, it's a it's a huge continent with completely different um, parts and and so on stories. But uh, yeah, so uh, I think you know uh, you, you see a lot of commonalities between Chile and Argentina and also uh, between the the feminist movements uh, in Chile and Argentina simply because of the very kind of of uh, quite similar um, historical uh, background of, uh, of having a very similar dictatorships, but uh, at the same time, the same level of um, uh, of, uh, of neoliberalization and so on and so on. So Chile and Argentina generally are considered more, you know, modern uh, <laughs> uh, than, than, than the rest. But, uh, and then of course, um, so in the case of Ecuador and Bolivia, the, the feminism such as um, decolonial feminism coming from, uh, and the Buen Vivir um, is something that is 
really relates mostly to to the uh, Andean uh, Andean part, uh, much more rural, let's say, Latin America than uh, Chile and, uh, and and Argentina for sure. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much, Mina, for this interesting uh, presentation and uh, for the possibility to talk to you. It was very enjoyable. Um, so, uh, but our time is up at this point. Uh, so I would like to thank you for the whole of the organization team of the conference, uh, Združani, for being with us also for hosting some of the lectures. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see you again, right, over the weekend or? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. But uh, okay. I will be watching you. So thank you so much for <laughs> anyway inviting me today. And uh, oh, um, at least you can watch this uh, on the Facebook of Srujani anytime. Watch. Uh, we want to again. So thank you very thank much. You. Have a lovely rest of the evening. And just a little note for our viewers: we will be back in thirty minutes at six thirty with Srujani talk, which will be held in Czech. And we will be talking about uh, the feminism in Brno. So you can compare it then to Latin America. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mina. Thank you. Bye-bye.